Thanks so much for joining us for Next Up. In this next half hour, Ray and I will pepper two gentlemen with questions about what happened on Tuesday. We are joined on this Next Up by Ken Warren, pollster and professor at St. Louis University. Welcome back, Ken. And former state senator from Missouri, Mr. John Lamping. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we'll start with you, Ken, because um, a lot of people thought there'd be some sort of red wave that Republicans would uh, win in greater numbers than they did on Tuesday. So who was wrong here? The pollsters <laughs> or the media who are talking about this I red wave? I think the wave? media more than the pollsters, <laughs> but, you know, Ray and I will have a discussion on that probably later. But... Uh, no, the pollsters, in a, in a way, were, were right on in the major races. If you look at the Pennsylvania race, I think they were pretty close, if you, particularly if you look at not real clear politics that a lot of people look at, but you look at Nate Silver's stuff where he weights polls and, and makes projections on the odds of winning, and he predicted that Fetterman would win. And so I think overall the, the pollsters were, you know, pretty much were close. I mean, look at, look at Georgia. Did they not predict a neck-and-neck -neck race? And it is that. Did they not predict that Lake would win the governor's race in, in Arizona? Lake's going to win that, probably. And did, it, did they not predict that it was going to be close in, uh, for Kelly in Arizona? Mm -hmm. Or Johnson winning by a couple percentage points, you know, in Wisconsin? They pretty much got it right. And I, th I think that's right. And I think that the media... I, I think there are examples. For example, in Washington, they predicted Murray, yeah. Murray by to be like a four or five point race, and it was like a fifteen point race. So there were some they missed, but mm -hmm. you know, and I, I do think they underestimated the Dobbs effect. I do. I mm -hmm. think they underestimated women, mm -hmm. and not just women, but people on the pro choice side. They underestimated the turnout, and I thought the best example was back in August with Kansas, where mm -hmm. they predicted Kansas, the pro-life side, would win by four points, and it lost by 18, which is 22 points. I think there's that, but I think you're absolutely right that the the most of the of the whether it was on the left or the right, it was equal. All the stuff about a red tsunami, and all mm -hmm. the politicians out there saying it, and all the media was really the media. It, you know, I think part of it is the media on the left is still freaked out about 2016, and the media on the right was trying to r rally the base. So I think it. I think you're right that the media interpretation was worse than the polling. Yeah, it, it was pretty interesting times, unusual times in which we live. And that you're right, both the left and the right media uh, were in a panic. As we were, the right was, hey, this is going to be wonderful. And if you watch Morning Joe, the Tuesday election, they were the apoplectic that there was going to be this huge wave. But in the end, Ken's right. All the polls said razor, razor thin. And then what happened on our side, I think, was the fact that, you know, we looked historically, it's, it's the midterm. Uh, we have a president who's way down in popularity. We've got a uh, wrong track, right track at 75%. Um, and we look at the issue sets, all the things that Republicans do, did and can run on, and it just looked like it was, it was primed to be a, some kind of red wave. You know, at the end of the day, it looks like we're gonna, we're gonna own the House, hold the House. And I think there's a very good chance that we have a majority in the Senate. And if you went to Republicans two months ago and said, how would you like, you know, a plus 10 in the House and a plus one in the Senate? And they would be happy to have had that be the outcome. Hmm. How about the Senate race in the state of Missouri, John? Uh, Trudy Bush Valentine, first time she ran for office. She obviously had money, but no experience, especially since, you know, U.S. Senate's a big job. But let's say... Uh, the Democrats put someone else up there. Uh, it could have been uh, what Chris Coster came out of uh, private private sector, or Clint Zweifel, or Claire McCaskill. Is there any Democrat, in your opinion, any Democrat who could have defeated Eric Schmidt this year in Missouri? Well, you would think not, except that I think uh, if you look at how Eric ran his campaign, I would think maybe you could have with a different candidate. I actually, quite frankly, I thought Lucas Kuntz, who mm -hmm. lost to Trudy in the primary, would have given would have, would have changed the I entire the, the entire nature of Schmidt's campaign. I think it would have been much more difficult for, for Schmidt. He wouldn't have been able to campaign the way he did in the primary. Essentially, he didn't campaign after the primary. And you know, some of those names was kind of like the all-star you know Democratic bench. Maybe, maybe I mean, maybe maybe you know uh, Chris Coster is always in the back of everyone's minds as someone who could be formidable once again. But but in this year in in 2022, the Democrats ran the perfect candidate for Eric. They ran a candidate that had no chance of winning and uh, made it a lot easier for Schmidt. Right, well, I want to ask you about, you, you put a pretty good spin on there for your 
party, which is, is good. I, as far as the Senate, th you do have to win two out of three. You have to unseat two out of three incumbents uh, in, to do that in, in Cortez Masto in Nevada, which looks like your best chance. Kelly in, Mark Kelly in uh, 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 Arizona, which doesn't look good. And I would argue Herschel Walker is, you know, maybe not the best candidate you've ever had come down the pike, and he did lose by a reasonable margin in the in the first uh, first election here. But but let me ask you this: What I mean, you say that people would be happy with it, but the the typical return in a uh, in a midterm election, the t typical outcome is 30, 40, 60 seats, and everybody was you got to admit everybody was expecting that. Um, is there going to be it seems like there's more people calling out the former president now mm -hmm. than there have been. Mm -hmm. Do you not see some sort of uh, civil war in the Republican Party over this? Well, there's two, two parts. So, so 40 to 60, that would constitute a wave. That would be right. a wave. Okay? But that's so, what everybody's calling. But, well, we we're hopeful. We we're hoping that No, they were calling it. I mean, there's right. a whole montage of Ted Cruz and other people that were calling it. Right, that. And, and Joe Scarborough, too, was worried about a wave, too. Sure. So it's both sides. No, I understand. Yeah, right. So, um, well, Obama lost 63 in right. 2010. But, but what's mm -hmm. a little bit interesting and different in this instance is that, you know, Biden came into office in 2020. He won with 81 million votes, and he lost 14 House seats. So, in, ter in terms of the historical precedent, it, that would not have occurred under normal circumstances. Right. Normally, if somebody sweeps themselves into office in the presidency, they bring along with some coattails where the House goes with them. Mm -hmm. So you look back, and maybe what happened, and what I'm suggesting, is the, the 10 to 15 seats we pick up this time, we picked them up in 2020. So if, if it were a normal presidential cycle and Biden came into office picking up one or two in the House, then there would have been 30 seats to pick up. Yeah, I so I think we basically picked up the 15 we did in 2020, and now we're going to pick up 15 more. And that's more of your traditional. Yeah, but putting it in a historical perspective, you would have expected that that the uh, party occupying the White House would have lost a lot of seats. If you go back to 1866, only three times did the party occupying the uh, White House not lose seats. All right, 1934, 90, 1998, and 2002. So Biden really has bucked this trend because he's, he's going to lose seats, but he's going to lose hardly any seats. But I, I would go back to, to 1978, Carter's midterm, where everyone expected a tsunami with Carter's midterm, and he actually uh, over, he overperformed. He had lost three senators and mm -hmm. 18 House seats. And so I think it's a lot more like that. It's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that are very similar to 1978 in the economy, inflation, things like that. But that was Carter's midterm. And so for Republicans, we, we like what came after that disappointing. Trump lost, Trump lost 40 seats, by the but, way, House seats, but, and, but he gained two Senate but, seats in, in 2018. After Tuesday, Ken, do you think there's less pressure for the president to step aside and not run for re-election? No, I think there's going to be still pressure. You know, when you look at how old he is, he would be 80 years old. 82. When he, well, when he, when he when on when he runs. January 20th, that's right, uh, in, in 2025, he would be 82. Okay, 86 when he left. That's right. ridiculous. But let's look at Trump, if Trump ran. I mean, he would be in his 80s too. Right. You know, this guy is no spring chicken either. So, you know, it's looking better for younger people like the 44-year-old DeSantis to step in mm -hmm. and run as a Republican. He probably will uh, attract a lot of people being as young as he is when I think people are looking f for younger candidates now. Because they do think age mm -hmm. is a factor, by the way. What do you think about that, uh, John? <clears throat> oh, uh, oh, in what respect? Uh, Just the question about Biden and whether oh, this Biden. Well, fact. look, uh, right. I think the Republican Party would certainly welcome Biden running for re-election. Uh, you know, it would be... Uh, when we look for silver linings um, on Tuesday night, one of the silver linings was just that fact. Uh, and it's interesting because the president then had a press conference yesterday, I think, mm -hmm. and he kind of came out and said, you know, didn't I do so very, very well? There's no reason for me not to, to go anywhere. And I haven't decided yet. He was asked that question. He intends to run. In but fairness, I don't think he will. In fairness I don't and think I'm an independent, but I will say <clears> the <throat> Democrats would be more happy about Trump running than the Republicans are about Biden running. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I want to ask you this. You, you alluded mm -hmm. to Biden's low popularity. If, and I, this is for both of you, but, but Biden's popularity is roughly the same, 
it's a little higher than Trump's was at mm -hmm. this point. It's By two about percentage the, points. It's Trump's about the same as Obama's was. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. the same as Clinton. I think it's the, identical to Reagan's. I think it, it the was the same, same as Reagan's. It was. It mm -hmm. was just obviously at this time, George uh, W. Bush was at this point was at you know, one point was after 9-11 it included approval of 91 percent mm -hmm. including me i mean you know there was a mm. lot of us but i mean so that, i guess my question is why is this i know it's a great narrative mm -hmm. but joe biden's popular is no more unpopular mm. than trump was why why make the i don't remember republicans talking because he's about ineffective this. on the on the but campaign uh, well and so he, he had but the his popularity isn't any different well it, campaigns are different There's not, mm. you don't you have to campaign you don't pull now he had the opportunity in this last cycle to stay home. We were in the middle of a pandemic. He campaigned from his basement, as we like to say. But that that would be different. And you see they kept uh, a very short lease on, on Biden during the midterms. He went to just a few blue states. And even there, he managed to stumble and, uh, and gaff and talk about mm -hmm. getting rid of coal and getting rid of not drilling anymore. So, but you know, what's interesting, you mentioned- I, I wanna hear your response oh. to that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's Danny Brook, come on. Yeah. But he picked up, you know, uh, two percent of the independents, two points among independents, when the average loss among independents going back to 2006 has been 15. That is an enormous turnaround. And, and I think that was really the difference in these elections. The reason you didn't experience that red wave is that independents did not, not go for the out party, which they usually do. They went actually two points for I agree. the, I the uh, you know the Democratic Party and that's that's extraordinary mm -hmm. and is that due to Biden campaigning or B Obama campaigning no one knows because political science you see is not a science I was gonna ask you uh, about uh, Missouri John uh, here here we have the, the third time when a relatively progressive ballot measure or amendment mm -hmm. passes mm -hmm. I mean you we already had expansion of Medicaid. Voters approved that mm -hmm. at the polls, and they rejected right to work, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that was kind of progressive. And this time, the legalization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. So let's say Ray writes a column saying that there should be an amendment guaranteeing a right to an abortion mm -hmm. in the state of Missouri. And Which I hope I you do that. Do you think that'll come to fruition? It'll be an amendment, and it would pass in the state of Missouri. We'll be curious to see what, what the language of the amendment is, is right? Think. Okay, so um, I, I fully expect it. It's coming, okay? And and you referenced some other um, initiative, peti not initiative petitions, they were, well, initiative petitions uh, for the most part that passed. And the challenge here in, uh, in Missouri or any place really is if somebody puts forward an initiative and they spend the money to get it on the ballot, it's about a million and a half dollars to collect signatures, and then they want it to pass right to work, uh, Medicaid expansion, and they spend tens of millions of dollars more to try to get it to pass, the opposition is usually not in a, in a, in a circumstance where they have money to fight back, right? So, uh, when you, but when you do a, a pro-life ballot initiative, which will come, there will be pro-life money to, to take it on. So it's going to be an interesting mm -hmm. challenge. Most mm -hmm. initiative petitions, like for example, the Amendment Three this time, well, there was a ton of money to pass Amendment Three, but there was no money to fight Amendment Three, and that's how a lot of our petitions go down. Well, on that point, uh, the. House, the incoming House uh, leader, mm -hmm. uh, Dean Plocker mm -hmm. from St. Louis, uh, De Pere. Is, I know uh, Dean. I, I'm Quite sure well. you know him well. <laughs> and I, I, was, I had his name pronounced right. That's Plocker. exactly right. And Dean's a, you know, a, I, I think a traditional Republican as opposed to a MAGA one. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I don't know even know where you call yourself these mm -hmm. days. Because there is a, a mm -hmm. paradox. But he's already uh, rumored to be, or maybe he said, going to go for what they call initiative reform, mm -hmm. which will be to discourage these. And that's going to be a big item because I do think, and you know, I, there's no danger. I'm going to write about this probably next week in the RFT. There's no danger of that having any impact on anybody. But uh, my own view is that the, the initiative should be completely modeled after the U.S. Constitution. It should not be 39 pages. It ought to say very simply, Congress, in this case the state of Missouri, shall pass no law restricting the right of abortion in the first 13 mm -hmm. weeks, is mm -hmm. what I'd say. That's mm -hmm. so. Okay, so then you're actually... I'm not, yeah. I'm not okay. suggesting... I do yeah. not think the codification of Roe would work, mm -hmm. but I think something in the first trimester would have a very definite... A 13-week would have... I think it would have a chance to pass. Now, okay, well, again, they're going to try it, but uh, do you think they're going to... I want to ask I'm sorry. Do you think that they will try to head that off with a, a making it harder to do initiatives? Well, 
we really should change the way we do initiative petitions. I mean, the, the, the way we collect signatures, the fact that it's only six of the eight congressional districts is ridiculous. There are two very conservative parts of the state that didn't, the signatures weren't required to pass Amendment 3. Okay. Um, and it's a simple majority, and I think that's completely wrong. You know, yeah. you look at what's happening now is instead of making constitutional amendment changes, they're legislating in the, in the Constitution because right. it's so simple. Well, and because the legislature is what it is, but do, when do you think, how but, much would you make it? How What percentage would you well, say? Well, I mean, it's more commonly closer to 60 or two-thirds, but I will tell you it's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is the political consulting class. So you'll, the highest profit margins for political consultants are initiative petitions. <laughs> they get paid to collect the signature, or they, they have companies that help collect the signature. On both sides. Mm -hmm. On both sides. And it's huge, it's huge, okay, huge okay, margins. But that's, that's right? So it's in their interest for the General Assembly to be unable to get that to the ballot. And you know, uh, that's something that I, I first got to the General Assembly in 2011, and people such as myself have tried almost every year and you're just not going to win because it's too profitable to the consulting class. Would, would such a um, measure ever pass in Missouri, I, th I think the chances would be high that it would pass. The, the polling data show that if you're talking about pro-choice, women's right to choose, it's passing in conservative states like Kentucky the other day. I mean, in a opposition to at the passage of an amendment to prohibit it, Kansas, I mean, all over the place it is, even in conservative places. So, so uh, w polling has consistently shown, my polls as well as others, that 60-some percent of Missourians uh, favor pro-choice. So then how does Eric Schmidt become the next U.S. Senator from Missouri? That's a good question, and we, did, we polled on that in our SLU uh, YouGov poll, and we showed that it wasn't a deal-breaker, that Missouri is so red that even though most people uh, were uh, opposed to, to the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Those people did not come around and not vote against uh, Schmidt as a result of it, though. It, it was, I mean, it, this state is simply too red. There's too many Republicans for that to be a deal breaker. Well, 13 weeks wasn't on the ballot either. Right, like for Ray, for you to say 13 weeks is where we're going to go. No, I'm no, that's no, a no, big I didn't change. Say that. I said what I'm going to suggest. Right, well, okay. where we're going. That's gonna right. Because right. nobody's going to listen to me. Right. But I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm saying 13 <laughs> weeks would be. Would, do you agree that would be an interesting challenge I, to you? Re, rather than even say codify Roe, I'm talking about a more conservative approach. By that'd the be very person. smart. I think politically, it'd be very smart. And you know, that's I'm a big fan of federalism. I celebrate right. the fact that Roe v. Wade was um, right. t turned over. And now it's back in the states, and that's you know, how I would approach yeah. it. As well. yeah. let me ask you. Uh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have a question? No, I, know, I, know. I, I got I questions, but I know I you do too. too. Do you want to do DeSantis? I love to. You can talk about DeSantis. Well, I do want to yeah, ask you both that. a question, yeah. and that is, um, I consistently we see Republican polls, uh, polls that show a majority of Republicans do not believe that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. Some fashion of that answer. Right. And I maybe I, I don't know what you, you made reference to 81 million votes for Joe Biden, which I don't think would be consistent with that. I guess my question is, um, I don't know, I don't think I know anyone who believes that. In other words, I now have a lot of Republican friends from having worked for Kit Bond in another century. I, I do not, do you, I mean, who, do Missouri Republicans really believe that, that that Donald Trump won the 2020 election? Because, I, I mean this sincerely, it's not a leading question. Right. I just, and I want to get your view of that too. Is, is that a real thing? Because I don't, you don't hear really much of that said, but it's, I, well, I, that's okay. it. something. Something wasn't right about 2020 election. And it's not just Republicans. You look at polls consistently since 2020, have been in the high 50s where both Republic the, the, of all the population think something just wasn't right. It wasn't, it, it didn't go the way the election was supposed question? to go. Okay. Uh, well, no, I, I think it's, I think it, it, that Do you think Donald Trump won the election? I don't know because I didn't. You don't think I it's don't sure know. that Joe, well, do you, do, are you not certain that Joe Biden won it fair and square? Well, look, I don't know what did or didn't happen in the last election. And like right now, I don't know what's going on in Arizona. I don't know what's going on in Clark County, Nevada. And and in the, that level of uncertainty, if you look at polls since 2020, 60, almost 60 percent of the country thinks something wasn't right, and that includes 35 percent Democrats. And so it's not just Republicans that feel that way. I want to hear what you say about this. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's that's um, uh, that's not right. Um, I, I think that the vast majority of Americans do agree that the elections are honest. Uh, some have problems with with the 2020 election, but you have to have you have to ask yourself 
how could they have problems with it? You take Arizona. They had audits on Arizona. Even Republican-sponsored audits <laughs> yeah, in California yeah, found out that, in fact, Biden won by more votes than, than what was recorded, not by many. But you had audits galore in Georgia. You know, you, you, it, it, recounts, recounts, audits, whatever you want to call them, and over and over and over again, the, the, uh, the tallies are the same. And what you say, we don't know what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on in Vegas, in, in La, 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 Nevada, and in, in Arizona. They're adding up the votes. Every, that's the way they do every time. And, and it's like, <clears throat> there's no, nothing nefarious about this. They have rules about, many states have rules that they can't start adding mm -hmm. the, the mail-in va ballots till after the right. election. There's nothing nefarious John, going that's on. That's what they don't understand. So a lot of people do not understand the fact that that Trump was so far ahead. I did Ray's show that right, night. Right. Trump, Trump was kicking tail, okay? And then we all knew, though, that all these mail-in ballots were going to come in. And to Republicans that were, you know, not savvy to the process, they, they felt that, oh, well, this, these all votes are cheating votes. And it wasn't the case. They were simply counting legal mail-in ballots. By, by which I think was corroborated by, by Republicans, Republicans well. judges, right. Republican right. secretaries of state. Judge. Okay, we've kind of plowed this uh, field <laughs> a few times in the past, but we do have a big victory by J.B. Pritzker in Illinois. And, oh, yeah. of mm. course, he, he won resoundingly over uh, Darren Bailey. And some people say that because his speech didn't attack Bailey but attacked Trump, that he's kind of positioning himself to be a possible candidate, Ken Warren, for mm. uh, the White House in 2024. Do you think J.B. Pritzker, whose you know, population is leaving the state and who's lost some corporations like Caterpillar and Citadel and uh, who else, Boeing, do you think mm -hmm. he's a, a fair candidate for 2024? Well, he wouldn't be my favorite candidate, but I, th I think that he's a very popular governor, but in a very <laughs> democratic state. <laughs> you know, just like DeSantis is a very popular governor in, in a very Republican state. So, um, yeah, Pritzker looks okay, but um, I think there are probably going to be other choices besides him. I think he intends to run, though. He can self-finance. That's a big yeah. part of it. Yeah. I think he's yeah. made it pretty clear he's going to run if he gets a yeah. chance. You know, money doesn't buy elections. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, but the I think Michael Bloomberg buys lots of candidates. <laughs> Michael that Bloomberg clear. kind of <laughs> proved that point. Yeah. Yeah. God, I, I, um, it's, fun. it's a good question, but on the other hand, if you had asked that question in 2006, say this uh, yeah. state senator... A black guy I from know. Illinois that no one's ever heard of. You think he can win? And nobody would have thought Barack Obama in this time, 2006, would have had much of a chance. Certainly Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Clinton. No, and, no. and uh, <laughs> do you, I, I do want to ask, I don't want to oversight, but sure. let's talk about Trump and DeSantis. Yeah, let's, uh, I'd Trump love and DeSantis, to, love to. What, how do you, I mean, I don't know if you're a Trump right. guy, or but there's a very clear distinction in the Republican Party, and again, for both of you, how do you think that's going to play out? I, I happen to agree that the Democrats will end up with a different candidate than, than Biden, but that's not the point here. Trump, okay, Trump or so DeSantis. Trump or DeSantis. No, no, no. So here's, here's another right. silver line from Tuesday night. Right. DeSantis cleared the rest of the field. He cleared the rest of the field. Okay. So we're not going to have, you know, 10 guys up on the stage. Really? So we got it's DeSantis and it's Trump. And I personally would like to see kind of a, like a cage fight. Have the two of them declare their candidacy, have a 10, 12-month campaign, series of debates, and I think that I think that we as a party and the country will learn tremendous more about DeSantis, and I think uh, it'll make them both stronger, and if whoever eventually wins that, that debate or wins that primary, it will be better for having done it. So that's kind of why I'm, I'll, I'll take the winner. You put those two guys in a cage fight for, uh, for the, for the position and I'm, I'm fine with whoever You're comes fine out. with Trump? If, if Trump can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with DeSantis right. in a primary, then that's good enough for me. So, John, um, you know, you have Allen, Paul Allen, who said everyone knows that Trump's not going to get it. But I don't see how you can stop Trump, given his popularity. I mean, from primary to primary to primary, how are you going to stop him? Uh, I mean, if people want to stop him, how are you going to stop well, Trump from winning the delegates? Well, because there, there's, a, there's a change, okay? What I mean by this is that what Trump did when he came in, and, and I, I predicted Trump was going to win for quite some time before 2016, mm -hmm. we've changed the party's makeup, okay? Mm -hmm. So now it's very, very clear we're the party of the working class. Uh, Non-college educated men and women overwhelmingly support Republicans and then essentially married people with, 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 uh, support Republicans. That's the coalition, and, that, and that's changed. Prior to that, think about some of the elite 
Bushes mm -hmm. and uh, Romney and all the people that ran. They were of the elite class. They were the country club Republicans. Now we're the blue collar Republicans. So things have changed. A this, lot. The, the blue collar Republicans that love Trump, support Trump, they like the way DeSantis handles himself. And they're not political junkies like the four of us are. But that group of people, they, they know who DeSantis is now. And they would love to see the two of these guys square up. And like I said, whoever comes out of that primary, if it's just the two of them, they'll be stronger for having gone through the primary. And the, the, what is now the Republican Party, the party of the despicables, will rally around whoever comes out of that, uh, that race. Seems like the party elite, though, is, is, is uh, starting to back off supporting Trump. They've already picked their candidate. Yeah. They're, they have embraced DeSantis. So that will yeah, be the first yeah, thing DeSantis yeah. will have to overcome. Paul Ryan two weeks ago came out and said, Santos is my guy. Jeb Bush announced he's going to raise money for him. Today, uh, Ryan released an editorial in support, mm -hmm. actually anti-Trump. Mm -hmm. So the, the establishment have got their guy. Trump's the populist. DeSantis sounds like a populist. And now the challenge for DeSantis is that he needs to bring in the populist side of the party at the same time mm -hmm. having everyone know he's an establishment guy or has, has establishment's blessings. So I, I think the party establishment is starting to see Trump as rather toxic. Given the, the you know, that whole insurrection the last, thing, that the last election does that the, play the, into the party? Republican Party establishment saw him as a problem the day he came down the elevator. Right, no, he's fair. No, so, no, you don't think so, the, the mm. people like yourself are not troubled by him trying to overthrow <coughs> democracy? Okay, so so the Democrats just a, in Pennsylvania elected Fetterman. Right. Okay, you've got Biden, who you all kind of say is too old to keep going. I, I didn't say that. So, I'm just so what I can do is I can look at that. President Trump's time. Seconds. I can look at his time in office and say. I'll take all those policies. Okay. So. John Lamping, thank you very much for Happy joining us. Here. Ken Warren, thank Pleasure. you as well. Thanks, Ray, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Thursday. Stay warm. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.